Thank you. South Metro Democratic Women's Council was established in 2014 as a local chapter of the Georgia Federation of Democratic Women. The Georgia Federation of Democratic Women is a sister chapter to the Georgia Democratic Party. Our organization has a four point mission. One, to engage women of South Metro Atlanta in a wide variety of political activities. Two, to provide members with substantive information regarding local issues. Three, organize educational and voter registration activities in the communities. Four, identify and encourage women of appropriate age to run for office at all levels. Our membership includes community activists, city council women, mayors, presidents of homeowners association, presidents of Greek sororities, and chairs of state organizations of the Democratic Party. Our bylaws have just been changed so that we can accept men into the organization in a non-voting capacity. The South Metro Democratic women, sometimes referred to as the ladies in blue, our geographical area covers all of South Fulton from I-20 south to Clayton and Fayette County lines, and of course, all cities in between. We are best known for hosting candidates forum, voter registration drives and Women History Month activities and interviews with various candidates that are posted on Facebook, and YouTube. And I will let you read some of our previously hosted forums. Thank you. And again, welcome to each of our committee persons. Welcome, especially to our candidates and their staff. They have kept me on my feet, making sure I sent them exactly what they needed in order for them to be prepared for tonight. Thank you and welcome. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yolanda Ogletree, who's going to give you the rules of the forum. Dr. Ogletree. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, contenders who are vying for the Congressional District 5 seat. I have been tasked to disclose the rules of engagement. First, the moderator will address candidates in random order. Secondly, Contenders will have two minutes for introduction and to reveal your campaign platform. In addition, candidates will have two minutes to answer questions. If a contender name is called by another contender, that contender shall have the right to a rebuttal. Time allotted for a rebuttal shall be 30 seconds. Thirdly, each candidate will be given two minutes to make a closing statement. Lastly, and most importantly, Ms. Brenda Floyd serve as the timer. Therefore, contenders, please listen for the sound of a bell, which indicate your time is up. Unfortunately, if you continue speaking after the bell, your line will be muted. 
Thank you, candidates, and good luck. Next, our very own Ms. Patricia Lovett will announce our dynamic moderator for this forum. A pleasure and an honor to introduce our moderator for this evening. And that is none other than Ms. Kathy Adams. Kathy's ability to lead was apparent in middle school and by her junior year in high school, she served as a Georgia Girls Program Ambassador at Middle Georgia College. Kathy's college career includes attending Atlanta University, where she studied political science and later at Phoenix University, where she earned a dual bachelor's degree in management and marketing. Kathy has been serving the community for more than two decades, and some of the organizations and her involvement includes serving as the immediate past state president of the Georgia Federation of Democratic Women, serving on the nominating committee of the National Federation of Democratic Women, and she has held multiple advisory and leadership roles, leading transformational activities, new program implementations, and educational programs. Kathy is a former delegate for the state of Georgia, a former state committee member of the Democratic Party of Georgia Executive Committee, a post seat holder in the 64th House District and board member of Atlanta Victims Assistance. Kathy has demonstrated an innovative approach to problem solving with a diverse business experience, including operations, learning and development, information technology, organizational change management, project management and facilitation, Kathy honed her skills in diplomacy and have sharpened her effectiveness as a thoughtful, innovative co-collaborator. She has served as the second vice president of Carrie Steele Pitts Children's Home, chair of Parent University, charter president of Toastmasters International at the Coca-Cola Company, a mentor and tutor at My Sister's House Atlanta Literacy Program board member of Emory University School of Public Health, Responsible Empowered Aware Living Men's Program, and currently serves as a co-chair of the Social Action Committee, East Point College Park Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc., and Kathy is the recipient of numerous leadership awards. Kathy is a mother and grandmother and is an active member of Cascade United Methodist Church. Without further ado, please let me introduce to you Ms. Kathy Adams. Kathy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Patricia, for your kind words. Uh, good evening to the ladies of South Metro Democratic Women's uh, Chapter, and good evening to all of our candidates and guests this, uh, that we have on board this evening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us, uh, to the candidates. Thank you for uh, taking the opportunity to share some information about yourself, your platform, and your vision uh, uh, for this seat. And thank you to the guests who are on board for taking an interest in learning about um, what the people who are running to serve in the leadership capacity for um, this congressional seat. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started for this evening. You have the guidelines, you have the rules, 
we are going to be very, um, you know, very good sticklers on time. So let's manage the time accordingly. And again, if a candidate should go beyond his or her speaking time, they will be muted. Very so, um, I'm going to go down, uh, go down the list and in alpha order by last name. We'll call out the candidates, and what I'll do is give each of you two minutes to share a little bit about yourself and your campaign platform. So with that, I'd like to start with Robert Franklin, if you will. Go ahead and share with everyone uh, your campaign platform and a little bit of information on what you want the candidates to know about yourself. You have two minutes. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Uh, uh, Jenkins, to all the leadership, to the women, ladies in blue, to my fellow candidates, and to all who are viewing and participating this evening. It's a real privilege to join you. Thank you for your longstanding mission to educate voters and to recruit candidates. So it's very appropriate that we are here doing this tonight. My name is Robert Franklin. I'm running to fill the seat vacated by our beloved and esteemed Congressman John Lewis. And on September 29th, voters will have the opportunity to decide who will complete the current term of Congressman John Lewis. This is important because at this moment, the voters and citizens of the fifth district do not have a voice, do not have a vote, on key issues that are facing Congress right now. Defending the post office, protecting your health by fighting COVID-19, protecting our right to vote and helping to eliminate structural racism and police violence. Right now, there's a time of mourning and heartbreak throughout the land. 5,000 Georgians have died from COVID, 177,000 Americans, and we've lost John Lewis. So our hearts are heavy, and yet we need to come together to continue his legislative and moral agenda, even as we continue to mourn Congressman John Lewis. Make me your Congressman on September 29th. I will hit the ground running to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and to protect your health by empowering our government to do everything possible to flatten the COVID curve. Right now, time is short, and you need someone representing the fifth district in Congress who, is, who knows Congress and- Mr. Who knows Franklin, there's time. And it'd be my honor to serve as your Congressman. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to Councilman Kwanzaa Hall. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm Kwanzaa Hall, former Atlanta City Councilman. I served for 13 years on the City Council and two years before that on the school board. I'm running because I grew, just, grew up just one house down from Congressman John Lewis. He and my father served in civil rights together. They were in Montgomery. Uh, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And growing up, he was a mentor to me. He was a person I looked up to. He and his wife took my hand when my father passed away and ensured that I participated in Congressional Black Caucus events. Uh, he urged me, he and Lillian urged me to go on to apply to the West Point and Annapolis uh, Air Force Academy. And I was admitted to all of those. I chose MIT. And, you know, as an elected official, we worked very closely on several items that are not complete. Um, I think that we have a unique opportunity, one, to ensure that we have a person elected, and I hope that person is me, on September 29th without a runoff, so that we can have a person who can not only stump for the Democratic Party, but also has a track record for getting things done in a legislative body, no matter how short the time. In 60 days, I think there are a couple of items that I know I can get done. I won't release all of them right now, but I've been working really, really hard in the heart of the city to get a lot of things done. I've worked across the aisle. I've worked with all types of groups and I think I can demonstrate the same thing for the fifth district. We need a smooth transition for the democratic nominee, not Nikema Williams. I'm gonna make sure that 
she has an easy handoff and she can hit the ground running uh, to do the next two years of work. I'm committed to our, our district. I'm committed to our state. I'm committed to our nation. The voice of District 5 is a voice that has to resound louder, louder and larger than just the district it is in. So there are conversations nationally that I will also have as your elected official that must be on the table. I've led on criminal justice reform. I've led on economic development, ensuring that jobs were created in my district as a council member. The track record speaks for itself. And I'm asking right now for your support to ensure that we win this race without a runoff. I'm Kwanzaa Hall, and I wanna be your next Congressman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman. Next we have Barrington Martin. Do we have uh, candidate Barrington Martin online? Okay. Next, we'll move on to Chase Oliver. Good evening, and uh, thank you to the Southern Metro Democratic Women's Council for allowing me this chance to speak uh, to all of you. My name is Chase Oliver, and I would like to be your candidate for United States Congress in this special election. Uh, my platform is one rooted in criminal justice and taking the voices of those who have uh, been fighting uh, and, and protesting in the streets of the District 5 for these changes. And I want to take those voices and I want to bring them to the halls of Washington, D.C. Uh, very loudly. And I want to fight for changes that can be made during the short term, things like ending qualified immunity. There's a four page bill currently uh, in the House of Representatives that has been co-sponsored by Justin Amash and represented by Anna Presley and it could pass if it only had the political will of the establishment. Qualified immunity would allow Jacob Blake to be able to sue in civil court and get justice for being shot seven times in the back, for having a severed spinal cord, for being paralyzed, for having his life in, uh, altered forever, and he needs to seek justice. But thanks to things like qualified immunity, it's harder for people who are victims of police violence to achieve that justice in a court of law. I wanna fight for things like ending cash bail, Currently right now, there are 500,000 people across the country who are in jail. The only reason that they are too poor to afford the bail to get out. This is a two-tier justice system where there's justice for the rich and justice for the poor. And I think that needs to change. And we can change that very easily. And lastly, I wanna fight for a 50 state voting rights act to honor the late John Lewis. Because while there is uh, voter suppression in the old Jim Crow South, there's voter suppression all over the country and we need to address it. And the way we honor John Lewis is to address voting rights in all 50 states. So that is the Voting Rights Act that I would seek to fight for. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from all the other candidates and getting your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Stephen Muhammad. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, greetings. My name is Stephen Muhammad, and I'm running for the 5th District Congressional seat. This is a seat that has meant a lot to a lot of people. But one of the things I don't think it has meant a lot to is when you look at the district and you look at DeKalb County, Clayton County, South Metro, those areas normally are neglected. The fifth district has definitely been taken care of inside the city of Atlanta. We need to put together a situation where the entire district is represented. So South Metro, South Metro, she, South Metro has been neglected in the process. South Metro is a situation that is separated from the city of Atlanta because it wants to be able to have and do its own independent thing. I, as an independent, understand what it's like to be independent and want to have your own freedom, your own way in the sun. So as an independent, understanding South Metro's needs and wants and desires and aspirations, we will set together programs that will allow South Metro to be able to be represented, to have a voice in Washington, D.C. that will give them a chance to put their agenda, their desires on the table. That's what I plan to do. Thank you, would, Mr. Uh, would you all please turn my video back on? My, I'm off. I can't, my video's off. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad. 
I see that uh, Mr. Martin has joined, Barrington Martin. Um, would you go ahead and uh, share a little bit of your platform with us, please? Two minutes. Yes, ma'am. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Barrington Martin II, and I'm simply here to provide modern day solutions to modern day problems. And when I say that, I mean that I'm not here to uh, reinvent the wheel, but I want to revolutionize the wheel. I believe that we are at the forefront of political renaissance in which I feel the people deserve more. And I think that it's time for the government to deliver um, more to the people. Now, I'm born and raised from the district. I feel that, you know, it's my home that I love deeply. And I feel that I have a distinct obligation to make sure that my families, my friends, the people of this district, but especially the children that I teach are being taken care of right now and in the future. I think it's imperative to have someone that's homegrown, like such as myself from the district as well. I have distinct leadership roots in which I grew up watching my family canvas with the great Reverend James Orange for civil rights. Um, icons who went into the political forum and I was mentored and my father as well was mentored by um, former SCLC president Howard Creasy Jr. And I think that um, well, along with that pedigree as well as sharing the birthplace and the home of Atlanta with great men such as the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as well as the great Congressman John Lewis, it takes a person with the courage that I have to um, deliver on the dream that Dr. King had for our city as well as our nation. Um, I'm taking the blueprint that he left us to new heights. And I know you guys are wondering, what is, what is this blueprint and how you do this? This blueprint is basically my idea of it's called the People's Bailout. The People's Bailout has a foundation in universal guaranteed healthcare, universal basic income, equality education, criminal reform, as well as rounding off with the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment. Um, I entitled this the People's Bailout because I feel like that is finally time for the people to feel empowered or more so possess freedom through true economic and social equity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrington. Next, we have um, State Representative Abel Mabel Thomas. A peace and love to everybody. I'm glad to be here and I would like to speak to uh, uh, the other candidates to say to you, uh, appreciate your participation uh, because democracy does belong to us all. Uh, I believe that I'm the most uh, qualified person for the position based upon my experience and my being on the ground even as we speak. I have the opportunity to serve in the Georgia General Assembly and our last uh, serving was June 26th. And at that time, uh, I was able to address an issue that I think is very dear to all of the candidates is uh, black women die three to four times more than any race at childbirth. Therefore, we uh, were able to pull together a coalition that I led that we were able to say to the state of Georgia, enough is enough. We must expand Medicaid postpartum. Right now, women die um, at, at not just at childbirth, but they die between that time of birth all the way up to about 12 months. And we felt that it was enough was enough. And um, when we went to the budget writers, they basically said, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we can't deal with that issue. We'll give you a little money and come back in January and fight for it. But we as black women specifically decided, no way, we're gonna fund this program. We're gonna get this bill passed and we were able to get this bill passed to the tune of $21 million. And then from there, we were able to get $500,000 for Morehouse School of Medicine for a Center for Excellence, where they can follow up on work and research, uh, training, as well as uh, community engagement. So my record stands for itself. I'm also the author of the first mandated benefit in the state of Georgia it requires insurance companies to pay for mammograms. Your representative, your time is up. I've just been notified. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Representative Keisha Waits. I see she's online. Can I get someone to unmute her or? How's that? Perfect. Okay, terrific. Can you, is there an echo? Because I, I, I have these if you need me to put them on. Uh, no, you're good, but we can't see you. Okay, 
So I struggle with technology. Uh, one, I'm excited to be with all of you tonight and, and greetings to all of my colleagues this evening. Representative Thomas, I stand on your shoulders. Thank you for your work and your service to Georgia. Very, very quickly, um, I think anybody here is qualified to serve in Congress. That is my true belief. I think the question is, in a three week period of time, uh, preferably 90 days, who can get the most done? And, and I'm not interested in pitting us against one another. I think that's unnecessary and divisive. Uh, I believe uh, that um, it's important that the next member embody the spirit of servanthood uh, that the Congressman had, the late Congressman John Lewis. Uh, that is a spirit of justice, equity, and fairness. And I think that's going to be important. I think it's important that you judge us based upon what we have already done. Everybody here tonight is well accomplished. We already know that. Uh, I am proud of having a progressive track record. Uh, I am proud of offering outstanding constituent services during the time frame that I had the privilege of serving in the Georgia General Assembly. Uh, I will tell you that I am in this race because I consider it an extraordinary privilege and honor to be able to serve following someone like Congressman John Lewis. And I also grew up in District 5. I am a lifelong 47 year resident. I own my home and a small business here in the district. And so I look forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, and hopefully uh, the, the viewers will, will walk away uh, with some information that will help them to make an informed decision. Again, I thank all of you for offering the opportunity for us to speak and to come before you. Thank you. Representative, thank you so much. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And just remind everyone, you have two minutes to respond to the questions. If at any point your name is called, then there will be a 30 second rebuttal uh, by the person whose name is mentioned. Uh, we do have a timekeeper on board who will manage that. Should anyone get close to the time uh, and or um, use all of their time, you will be muted. So, uh, and I will ask the questions randomly and we do have a few that are um, already in the pipeline. We will take some questions via chat, but um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start with um, uh, Chase Oliver. And one of the questions I have is, Section five was taken out of the Voting Rights Act of 1964. What do you propose to change that? And what would you do to add to the act? Or what would you add to the act? Mr. Oliver. Well, thank you for the question. And as I alluded to in my opening statement, um, I think the way you get around the way the Supreme Court uh, erroneously threw out uh, section five uh, by saying that it was specifically targeting only the Jim Crow states is that you get around that by making it a 50 state voting rights act. It'll pass the constitutional muster of this right wing Supreme Court, and it will allow all 50 states to be able to address voter suppression efforts in their states. It'll allow for that oversight so that every person who wants to vote has the ability to vote. And uh, while I do have the time here, I want to say I support any way that you are able to vote, mail-in voting, absentee voting, or if you want to safely get out to the polls, I support you doing that. And uh, I think every American should have the right to vote. Uh, and by creating a 50 states voting right act, not only are we ensuring uh, the enfranchisement of everyone, but we're also passing that Supreme Court muster. And we are honoring the late John Lewis in a way that, uh, that signifies, you know, this isn't just a Southern problem. This is a problem that's all over the country and we need to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have a question. What is your number one proposal to help right size the education system regarding resources and COVID-19? Barrington Martin. Um, yes, ma'am. I think that the number one important thing is infrastructure. And by that, I mean access um, to broadband, broadband internet services. And I think that it should be free um, for all of the children um, who are involved within the education system. I am, if you all don't know, I'm a special needs educator and I'm already seeing um, the, the damages that the the pandemic is going to have on our children is going to be lasting and lasting um, for all time. So I think that it's important that to negate the negative effects for the future, we have to ensure that our children have the access to the necessary infrastructure, as well as internet services, as well as um, 
equity to many of the services that you may find in higher income areas. I teach mostly Title I children that are children and are in highly impoverished areas. And I see that they are victims of their situation. And that's not fair to them because they didn't get a chance to choose the situation that they were um, born into. So I think that in um, going f further, we're going to see that this pandemic has taken away a lot of the quality time that um, teachers spend um, in one-to-one one-to-one um, um, -one -one relationships with their kids and you know the extra attention that sometimes we get a chance to pay attention to our children and that's been removed from um, the children's lives based on the pandemic. So I think that we basically have to play catch up, fill in the gaps that have been left by the pandemic and allow our kids to possess or access um, the necessary infrastructure they need in moving forward and having a better and quality education. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. The next question, would you cut social services for older Americans if it meant lower taxes or would you propose higher taxes for more services? Kwanzaa Hall. Councilman Hall. Okay, I see that he's still Unmute. on. There we go. I'm on. Sorry about that. <laughs> Absolutely okay. no cuts of services to older Americans. I would, number one, look at places in the budget that we could find extra fat and cut it. And then if we have to, you have to raise taxes. We've done it in the past and it happens from time to time. But there's going to be some really serious challenges that we're facing as we come out of the pandemic and as we figure out how we pay for all of the stimulus. So we're gonna to have to figure a new way to make do. We're gonna to have to support entrepreneurs and empower families and children to have a, additional augmented sources of income. And even for seniors, just people are transitioning out of the way of work of the past and the new way of work, this new normal that we have, we've got to give people technological tools that allow them to provide value in the new economy. So I think there's kind of two places. One, you cut fat, two, you don't raise taxes. And three, you empower people to generate additional revenue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. What constitutional amendments would you recommend changing that will enhance the constituents' quality of life? Mr. Franklin. Thank you for that important question about what constitutional amendment would you consider or propose changing? Uh, frankly, none of the existing 27 amendments would I change. However, I would firmly support and be a strong advocate in Washington for passage of the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. That amendment is long overdue for being fully added to the US Constitution and becoming the 28th Amendment. Uh, it, we have some interesting challenges that are now emerging because five of the states that have already passed ERA uh, have rescinded their earlier decisions. But I think that needs to be put back on the docket since it has re, uh, had significant success uh, in the past. It's also appropriate in this year because we are all celebrating joyfully the passage, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that empowered uh, women to vote. And yet we recognize it uh, did not complete its task entirely. That is, it empowered white women to vote. Uh, so African-American men were voting as of the 15th Amendment. Uh, uh, white women were voting as of the 19th Amendment. But it took the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to empower African-American women, ERA. While I have the time, I would like to suggest that I think all of my fellow candidates are probably answering the fundamental question that so many voters have. There's a lot of fog about this election. There are two elections, one a special election on September 29 in which seven of us, of us are running. That winner will occupy the seat for the, for, until January. Nakima Williams is running for a new two-year term that begins in January. That's the November election. Let's keep them separate. Let's care about the September 29 election because these are the final days of John Lewis's term. They are sacred. Thank you, thank you very much. Next question. What is the one issue that would cause you to vote on shutting down the government to force a solution on that issue? 
representative weights. Uh, th that's a tough question. Uh, having served for three federal agencies, I I'm not a fan in, of shutting down the government. Uh, but I do believe that uh, taxpayers and American citizens are our most precious commodity. And I think that anything that would disrupt their way of life uh, is something that we need to consider. I certainly think COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, has devastated most of our lives. Uh, I think the thought of uh, cutting any social security benefits for uh, aging and working families uh, who have invested in our country over the years, I think would uh, be antithetical to American life. Uh, I think anything that would put our veterans and our troops in harm's way uh, certainly would be something that would concern me. But for the most part, I, I'm here to advocate uh, for those marginalized communities, uh, communities that have not always had a seat at the table. Uh, criminal justice reform is now coming to the forefront. And so those are some things that I'm looking at very seriously. But to answer your question in terms of shutting down the government, I, I don't know if that's something that I would ever be in support of unless it involved a situation whereas it put American families uh, in harm's way economically or in terms of their safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. What are the candidate's strategies to bringing economic equity and shared prosperity to South Metro Atlanta? Mm. And uh, Representative Thomas. I think she's still on mute. I think that there's a, a lot of issues that's, that's before us in terms of inequity. Uh, one of the things that we know for sure is that working class people not only don't have livable wages, but also they don't have a voice at the table. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go as far as even towards the South, I think what you were speaking of uh, that South Fulton or South has not really gotten the type of resources that the North has. And it's been an injustice that we've had to deal with all along. But what I'm here to say is black lives do matter. And we must continue to make sure that there's equity across the board and that people who work every day get a livable wage and have an opportunity to feed their families, to make sure that they are able to not only feed their families, but they can move up. Because what we're doing is just have the people that are at, the, at what we call homeless and at the bottom, just working, 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 low paid job and not getting the benefit. And so the same thing has happened on the south side. The services on the south side always are less than the service on the north side. We must begin to understand that all people, we're in this together and we must fight to make sure there's equity across the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. What plans do you have and what plans will you um, bring forth to getting Georgia's government to accept federal Medicaid monies? Me Mr. Muhammad. <laughs> That's a very good question. What will we do to get the Georgia government to accept Medicaid, Medicare money? So Medicaid money, yes, okay. What will we do? Well, first of all, from the federal level, we would make sure that we have the right amount of money targeted to the right programs and people. Then I would go to members of the house like we've done in the past when we got the uh, con contractors licensing bill passed. We went, we worked with various members of the house and the Senate, and we put together a bill to protect the seniors and the elderly, those who were dis disadvantaged so that they would be able to get their homes fixed and licensed contractors. At that point, you could just put a sign on your truck, drive around, and you were a licensed, con say you were a contractor, but you had to have 1,500 hours to be a barber. But what we did is there are certain key legislators who can move among the Republicans that are Democratic, like a fish in the ocean, unencumbered. The one we went to when we did that particular bill was Roger Bruce, a man that has the ability to talk to Republicans a little bit better. Now he might 
uh, not like me putting him on the spot, but he's done this many times that he knows how to move over and talk to the other side. Now that example of someone who was in the legislature or how to move among them, that's the example that I follow. How do you get other people with a different ideology, a different philosophy to work with you? I would get those legislators that are democratic and Republican who do not have a problem with working with one another, pull them together from the power of my office as the Congressman and have them say, now you all work together with your constituents, with your colleagues and put together the program so we can continue and have the governor pass this bill so that Medicaid money would come for health care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Would you vote to overturn a presidential veto to keep the government running? Why or why not? Councilman Hall. Uh, absolutely. If necessary, I mean, you. why would I align with any executive leader if it's against the principles that I stand for? One has to have a strong constitution when you choose to represent the constituents of your district and they're electing you to make the right decision. So sometimes I've made executive, uh, I made votes in support of executive leadership and sometimes I've made votes and st stood against them. Uh, that's just necessary uh, when you take a position like this. And I would definitely be willing to stand against uh, or for a veto depending upon uh, if it aligns with the values that I stand for. Thank you, thank you very much. The next question. Section five was taken out of the Voting Rights Act of 1964. What do you propose to change that? And what would you add to the act? I'm gonna pose that question to uh, Representative Waits. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think nationwide we have seen uh, some challenges. Uh, certainly, we can look at Wisconsin as well as our own state uh, in terms of issues regarding voter suppression. Uh, I think that uh, it's important that a lot of the language be restored, but I think we have to be realistic. I was on a forum earlier today, and it is important who is at the top uh, of the ticket, uh, who is leading, who is our president. But I think one of the first things we need to do is work around the clock uh, collaboratively, all of us here tonight to elect a new president. I think that's where we first need to start. The second thing I think we need to do is to work to elect leadership in judges that are sensitive to the challenges that we're facing surrounding this conversation. And I might add that voter suppression is disguised in many ways. It's disguised in long lines. It's disguised in closing precincts. Uh, it's disguised in uh, misinformation. Uh, in addition to what we see happening at the level with the Postal Service. And so certainly I think that more than ever that language is necessary. Uh, and I'd like to see that restored uh, to address some of the challenges that we see right here happening nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Realistically, you'll be in this seat for about 60 days. What do you think you'll be able to do in that short period of time, given the new and the unknown challenges of Congress. That question is for Chase Oliver. Thank you. Uh, so in that short period of time, one part of my platform that I think could totally uh, pass would be ending qualified immunity. There's the End Qualified Immunity Act, which is sponsored by Ayanna Presley, a progressive Democrat, and Representative Justin Amash of Michigan, a libertarian congressman. There's also Republican co-sponsors. It's a literal tripartisan bill, and the bill is four pages long, requires no amendments, minimal amount of debate, and we could pass it tomorrow to allow people to get justice when there is uh, improper policing and brutality done to these people. Luckily, Jacob Blake survived, and hopefully he will be able to get justice in a courtroom, but thanks to qualified immunity, that's an extra hurdle he has to cover. There are so many people whose lives have actually been lost to police brutality and their families deserve justice and their communities deserve justice. But thanks to qualified immunity, we have bad policing giving good policing a bad name too. This creates uh, distrust in our police departments. We can actually solve part of this issue. Now, of course, qualified immunity is not a silver bullet to finish all of the criminal justice issues we have, but it is a great first step that we can take and that can be passed during this uh, lame duck 
uh, essentially period of Congress. And if there, if need be, I think there's the votes if we push hard enough and we build coalitions to override a presidential veto on something like this. It's the voices of the people in the street who will need to be heard in the halls of Congress. And I will fight for that every single day I serve if I'm elected. That is something that can be done and should be done during this time right now. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. What are your strategies to bring economic equity and shared prosperity to South Metro Atlanta? That question is for Robert Franklin. Thank you, Dr. Adams. That's uh, an exceedingly important question as we are living our way through COVID-19 right now. We need to begin to reimagine the economy, reimagine education and preparing skills, a skilled workforce for the emerging economy. And so the voice in Congress has the ability to convene problem solvers. One of the things I would do on day two in office is convene key leaders who have already strong track record, demonstrated track records in promoting economic uh, development, but none of them who have done economic development in the past have done it in the context of COVID. That's a new setting. We need to puzzle our way through that together. I would convene. I'd call uh, Leona Davenport uh, Barr and the draw upon the resources of Atlanta Business League, uh, Tommy Dorch, uh, the Russell Innovation Center. I'd call on Kwanzaa Hall. He's been uh, doing important work in this area, as many have. I'd like to bring the best minds together to help provide leverage for reconstructing our communities. But it also has to filter into education. I'm a college president, a former college president. Uh, I was focused on college readiness, but I've also been focused on career readiness. And we need to mobilize more resources to prepare the future carpenters and plumbers and IT uh, leadership as well. Above all, we need to ensure that we teach our students character readiness. Whether they go to college or elsewhere, they must be good, decent, and honest people who have integrity and wish to serve the community. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. What constitutional amendments would you recommend changing that will enhance your constituents' quality of life? Representative Abel Mabel Thomas. Representative Thomas, uh, unmute your line. Okay, thank you. I, I would have to also follow back up with the whole prospect of the um, uh, ERA because we there was legislation at the state uh, for the ERA uh, did not really get a hearing on it, and I do think that women's um, there's, a, there's a expression called women hold up half the sky, and yet we don't get. Um, I think the percentages in terms of pay for women is about, for white women, it's about 82%. For black women, it's about 60%. And so what it is is we give equal work, but we don't get equal pay. And so the ERA would sort of open up the, the field and open up the, um, the, uh, the game in terms of women's empowerment. I think that uh, people know now that women are some of the uh, largest voters, and uh, subsequently, we deserve... Um, not only equal pay, but we need to be able to not have so many glass ceilings where we can't achieve and go to our next level. Uh, I think that we also need to look at the issue of reproductive justice and make sure that women control their own bodies and that they have the type of um, leadership in terms of making sure that women's voices are heard because whether it's maternal mortality, trusting black women, or speaking up for black women, speaking up for ourselves, I think the uh, ERA could strong step in the Constitution for us to have that happen in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Do you have plans for and would you get Georgia's government to support accepting federal Medicaid monies? That question goes to Barrington Martin. Yes, ma'am. Um, absolutely. And furthermore, I think that to strengthen our entire um, health care, I think that we have to implement um, universal health care. If not, what we 
must certainly have to do is implement a universal basic health care services. And by this, I mean that, um, you know, uh, free checkups, I mean, free mammogram services, free um, prostate services, a free cancer screening each year. And I think that all of these are essential, mainly because we live in a nation that is so abundant and we have to end this scarcity mindset that we have. And in order to better the lives of people, you, their, their lives have to be better in, in health and mental health. And that's why I also would like to propose um, free mental health screenings as well, all paid for by the United States government. And I think that this is essential to improving the quality of life of people, which will essentially improve um, the overall status of our nation in general. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much. And what I'm doing, just so you know, and I, um, so that everyone is aware, uh, each of the candidates will get an opportunity to answer some of the same questions. I'm just asking those questions in random order. I'm not going one, two, three, four, five, six, and everybody gets to answer the same question at the same time. So um, do know that you'll probably get an opportunity to uh, respond to a question that another opponent has already uh, responded to. So, but again, um, should uh, someone's name come up and they want to offer a rebuttal, then you uh, have that opportunity to, to do so and you have 30 seconds. And so I'm gonna move on. And uh, the next question is, what is the number one proposal to help right size the educational system regarding resources and COVID-19? And I'm gonna present that question to uh, Kwanzaa Hall. Thank you. Well, as a former school board member, we were talking about the digital divide uh, way back then in 2002 and 2003, and it's, the conversation still truly has not been addressed. But I think the COVID crisis really gives us an opportunity to reinvent education in America. We know that the majority of the children in, in our communities, uh, black and brown children, are not getting a fair share of educational resources, but also educational attainment. This is a unique and very special time. We know our kids play on these video games. They're geniuses at using the new technology, but there's been a slight disconnect. As we saw yesterday, the Zoom went down early in the morning for parents and teachers alike on the first day of school. So this is a great moment that we can reinvent it and probably find an opportunity for greater equity for communities that are greatest challenged, that are in on the margins and frankly have been left behind for many, many generations. So I'm excited about the potential of being in that conversation and whether it, you know, in this next couple of months or next year, when the rubber really begins to uh, hit the road, that we can actually drive an education agenda forward that revolutionizes um, rev uh, education in our country. And we can start with Atlanta, we can start with District 5, with some of the school districts here, and we all get on the same page and start looking at homeschooling in a different way, looking at how parents can be engaged, how other people can be engaged in children's lives online. You might not be able to engage your child, but if an uncle or a cousin also hops into the Zoom, maybe it changes that attention span. It changes the participation by the child. So we've got a lot of technological tools. We've got to make sure people have access to them, have access to the internet. And then we've got to empower people with the, the knowledge to use them and make sure that it's not predicated on you having a college degree to be able to be a parent uh, for children in this, this day and age. So just excited about what we can do with education because it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for most children. Probably 90% don't get what they deserve in public schools in our, in our, in our region. Thank you, Councilman. I see that your time is up. So next question, would you vote to overturn a presidential veto to keep the government running? Why or why not? Uh, Mr. Muhammad, that question's for you. Yes, thank you. Would I vote to overturn a presidential veto? Depends on what the veto was. I can't say just in a vacuum what I would and wouldn't do. Depends on the president, depends on the issue. Right now, I think that most of the group that I'm speaking to now hopes that Joe Biden gets in. This is the Democratic group. They hope that Trump is removed. Now, we don't know if that's a reality. 2016, everyone thought that uh, Hillary Clinton would be the winner of the election, but that didn't happen. Trump, Donald Trump came in. So now what do we do to ensure and make sure that we get a president that puts forth issues that we don't have to veto, override his vetoes? 
So step one means we need everyone to go out and vote so that we can have a president that's in there that our issues are addressed. That's why I'm an independent because we need to become a third political force. We need to band together that's people of color, women, poor whites, Asians. We come together as a force. And then we ask the Democratic and the Republican Party to address our needs. As long as we are stuck in one place, that person does not have to address our needs. They, they, they get in and they do not fulfill the needs that we have. So I, Stephen Muhammad, am an independent for that reason is so that we can get our uh, uh, needs addressed. So if we come together, the thing would be for me is to have a president that would address our needs when they go in there and there would be no need for uh, uh, overriding any vetoes. But at this point, it's a partisan thing, Republican and Democrat, and they fight each other. So it's a fight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next question. Do you support some form of Medicare for all as a supplement or secondary coverage to the Affordable Care Act? That question is for Chase Oliver. Thank you for that question. So uh, when I hear Medicare for all or Medicaid for all, what I actually think in my head is um, what is government health care? And I think VA health care for all, the Veterans Administration. And if you want to look at a failure when it comes to government administered health care, look no further than the VA. Uh, ask any veteran and they will tell you that they get substandard care, even though that they uh, themselves sacrifice off their life and limb. Uh, to serve this country. I think what we could do is we could do better by uh, instead of relying on this terrible insurance model that we have now, we should rely actually on a real free market system, which you know we hear all the time that the system we have now is free market, but it isn't really. It's an over-regulated market where we use insurance for every healthcare cost. Uh, imagine if you use uh, health insurance in a way uh, like you do car insurance. Imagine if your car insurance covered things like gas and tires and oil changes and you used it for everything. Well, no one would have any incentive to keep prices lower. What we can do is we can be pushing for lower cost healthcare. And that is something that we can do when we allow for more freedom of choice for people. And Medicare for all is not choice for everyone. Um, and I know I'm probably taking attack that many Democrats haven't heard before. And the truth is, is that you won't hear many ideas because of a two party system that just encourages partisanship. And you can agree or disagree with me. But the fact is, is that we need more voices and more choices to discuss these issues because they are important issues that don't require maybe a black and white or one size fits all solution. And I look forward to talking to more people about that. Uh, in terms of this term, do I think we're gonna be voting on a Medicare for all bill in the next four months? I don't think so. But if we were, I would open it up to debate and be happy to talk with anyone about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. What strategies would you bring to the table to help solve the problem of economic equity and shared prosperity for South Metro Atlanta? That question is for Barrington Martin. I'm so I'm happy that you asked me that. I think that um, earlier I spoke about um, the dream that MLK had and a part of this dream was an economic bill of rights. And this economic bill of rights is based on the foundation of universal guaranteed income. What universal guaranteed income does is it allows a proper starting point of equity for all Americans. And I think that implementing this um, within South Fulton, but mainly within many of the impoverished areas within the city, you will start people you will start seeing people, excuse me, have the agency to make the necessary decisions of their lives. You wouldn't have um, a person deciding whether to put food on the table or to pay a bill. You wouldn't have uh, women staying within relationships or negative relationships because of money. And they will be able to assess um, the necessary funds along with their regular everyday job to make the decisions they need to make for themselves to better their lives and to further their opportunities and equities um, within their lives as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Would you cut social services for older Americans if it meant lower taxes? Or would you propose higher taxes for more services? Representative Abel Mabel Thomas. No, no new taxes. The bottom line is that seniors under no conditions would I be called cutting any services to seniors 
they already are going through more than any other class right now during the pandemic. The fact that they have been isolated, uh, the, the services and the actual administration of these nursing homes, assisted living, and even some of the high rise, it's been ridiculous. So it seems to me that we need more regulation to make sure that our seniors are not suffering alone because that's what's happening during the pandemic. I believe that, that we need to really look at this whole spectrum and look at as, uh, the veterans, how veterans are being treated. We also need to look at small business, going out of business. Uh, small business need funding. And I talked about earlier, livable wages. I think that we're in a situation that we have to look at the budget, cut some of the pork out of the budget, but make sure if you're looking at the priority, you've got to look at the priority of our seniors and those are the working, what we call the working poor. So we do need to make sure that stimulus package, that care package comes in where people can, what, get uh, unemployment extended as well as not get put out of their home, whether in apartment or houses. This is an economic crisis, and I want to go to be a part of the team that helps us solve and make sure money gets in the hand of the taxpayer. Because right now, with uh, this situation here, we have taxation without representation. That's why you need to send Abel Mabel Tums. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question. Uh, some people take issue with the young people who sell water by the side of the road. In the spirit of John Lewis on a scale of one to 10, how important would it be to leverage your time in office to address the concerns of our youth? And I'm gonna pose that question to uh, Representative Waits, Keisha Waits. Okay, I'm trying to get on the muted here. So thank you so much for the question. Uh, it's a special question to me. And we were last asked this question in a previous forum, I believe. That is such a challenging situation because for so many different reasons. But nonetheless, uh, I don't believe in criminalizing our children. And uh, that is something that uh, even Representative Thomas and I worked on together at the General Assembly. I think the issue is, is how do we figure out how we can leverage opportunities? And I will give you an example. Uh, the City of Atlanta Workforce Department sent back millions of federal dollars that went underutilized. I think right now with COVID-19, many small business owners are struggling. And I think this would have been a very creative way to take some of those dollars to train our young people to get them employed uh, with much needed support to those struggling small business owners. Uh, the Department of Labor has a unique program uh, for individuals who are not working where they will actually give them employment assistance to go work for small business owners uh, who, again, need this type of support. So I think the question is, is how do we leverage those relationships and opportunities at the state and federal levels of government? Do I support young people selling water? I think that there's a way to do that. The only challenge that I have seen is oftentimes debris uh, and trash is being left behind. So certainly if our children are responsible and they are supervised by an adult, I have no issue with that. But again, my, my, my concern is to broaden and to expand the opportunities for young people in our community and to use federal resources and tax credits to ensure that they have every single resource to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. The next question, do you support some form of Medicare for all as a supplement or secondary coverage to the Affordable Care Act. And that is for Robert Franklin. Health is absolutely essential. And we have seen the negative impacts of what many physicians and public health leaders call the social determinants of health, which is to say not uh, simply access to health care, but whether or not people have housing whether they have jobs, whether they have transportation, and whether they can rest in, in, on a quiet bed at night, not fearing for crime in the streets or police banging, kicking down the door. So how do we look at these larger set of uh, determinants that impact people's health? That said, funding mechanisms can vary. Uh, they are deliberately experimental and dynamic. They should evolve. Medicaid, part of the genius there was that federal and state would both 
provide or contribute funds to ensure that we eliminate the coverage gap. It's tragic that several states, including Georgia, refuse to do that. As a consequence, there are uh, far too many people in this state not covered because of governmental leadership, because our governors did not have the vision and the courage to act. We left money on the table that could have helped uh, people who need the help. So new proposals will emerge, extending Medicaid, extending, uh, of course, Medicare is for uh, older population, but figuring that out is something that will absolutely need to occur. Frankly, it's not likely to occur during the 90, 60, or 30 day term that we have. What we need is someone representing and providing voice and vote for all of the healthcare needs, addressing the public health crisis of COVID, and speaking truth to power so that we can change the outlook for every Georgian, especially the 790,000 who live in the district. Mr. Franklin, that's two minutes. Thank you. Next question. What is your commitment to ensuring that affordable housing along with the Atlanta Beltline and to mitigate the placement of, and mit, to mitigate the displacement existing for the existing residents? Let me, let me rephrase that. What is your commitment to ensuring that we have affordable housing along with, along the, along the Atlanta Beltline to mitigate displacement of existing residents? And I'm gonna pose that question to Chase Oliver. All right, so um, one area of uh, housing that is very important to me is, is actually making sure that people get to stay in their homes. Uh, this is not necessarily relevant to the Beltline exactly, but uh, one group that I've been fighting for uh, for a long time are the people of Peoplestown in Atlanta who have been displaced due to eminent domain. Uh, eminent domain is something that should not really exist except for uh, serious circumstances. It's where essentially the government just says, you're no longer allowed to live here because we need to build a park or a bridge or a road. And many times these don't even get built. But in terms of uh, what would I do to create affordable housing, um, one way we do that is we actually get the government out of the way sometimes. Again, I know this sounds crazy to hear in a democratic forum, uh, and I am a libertarian candidate, but I would welcome people to uh, enter into that discussion as to ways we can make housing more affordable without using taxpayer funds. Uh, there are ways to do that. One way we can actually help people get affordable housing is to get uh, zoning requirements out of the way for things like tiny homes homes that are small and affordable for those who are actually uh, not the wealthiest people among us. I worked for a container shipping company. You can build a home out of shipping containers for a very, very low cost, but because of zoning requirements, and uh, many, many times it's city government that gets in the way of this, it's actually harder to build those small homes and those affordable homes for people to live in. And what you have in then is you get uh, condos, and of course you get people who are in the condo industry and the residential uh, uh, real estate industry who fund government and who lobby and basically corrupt the system to where the regular people are not getting their voices heard. And instead, it's the rich and wealthy elite who are getting their voices heard in Atlanta. And trust me, I know all about uh, real estate prices increasing outside of the realm of affordability here in the city of Atlanta. So uh, I think what we need to do is we need to have more honest and transparent government and one that's not bought and paid for by lobbyists in the residential housing industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excuse, me. excuse me. I'm sorry. Excuse me, even though he, um, uh, Mr. Chase did not necessarily call our name. There's such another different perspective as it relates to affordable housing. And uh, I don't know whether it would be appropriate for a rebuttal at this point, or maybe I just have to wait. For Go that. ahead, please. You have okay. 30 seconds. Okay. What I thought about is that what people keep doing is saying that the homeless should get in some type of container or get in some type of small business. The issue is, it's not just that. It's, the issue is economics. Get, make sure that the people who are homeless or who are marginalized get more income. It's not about making them in a smaller and smaller house. The bottom line is they need economic development and they need wraparound services to make sure that they can get out of the condition they're in so they can make a living so they don't have to live in a container. I don't want people to continue to push out. Poor people gotta be in the smallest of houses. They can live in a medium house. Representative, your 30 seconds is up. Thank you. Uh, next question. We all know that Representative Lewis was a drum major for justice for the LGBTQIA. And uh, what would you do to continue fighting for the LGB, the LGBT community to ensure that the rights mirror the rights of the heterosexuals? 
that question is going to go to uh, Stephen Muhammad. Thank you. Well, what I would do is what my platform says I would do. I'm for freedom, justice, and equality. I'm for equality of opportunity for everyone. Justice, equal justice under the law, regardless of creed, class, color, or sexual orientation. These are the things that I would push for. I would make sure that every American, regardless of where they are in their life or what it is that they do in their life, that they would get equal justice. Because I, as a Muslim, have been discriminated against. There are there's Christian churches that have not let me in. There are places that, I, that have said, no, we don't want you. So I know the pain and the hurt that it feels when someone, because of a part of aspect of your life that someone else doesn't like, they take it out on you. So no, we would fight hard. We would fight justly. I would fight very strongly to create a new reality for all Americans. That's why I'm running. I'm here to create a, a, a new reality that gives freedom, justice, and equality to everyone. Because right now, we don't have it. There's discrimination. There's division. There's this side and that side. It's, it's left and right instead of being in the middle and balanced. So I would fight to get justice and freedom and rights to everyone because that's what we need. Uh, right, one, one other point, when the, the nightclub shooting occurred in, um, in Florida where the Muslim went in and killed the people in the uh, LGBTQ nightclub. Here in Atlanta, we did a protest. I did it with uh, pals, uh, Melissa. We, I went on radio with them on the Rashad Ritchie show and said that that is not the Islamic way. We went and did a press conference to deal with that. I supported them and said that we as Muslims in Atlanta would not do such a thing. We would not attack somebody based on their sexual orientation. And that group, I supported them wholeheartedly in their efforts and they know that and we would create that new reality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Dr. Adams, may I also give a thought on that? Yes, you have 30 seconds. Certainly, uh, District 5 is certainly one of the most diverse uh, congressional seats in the country, and we also enjoy a very large LGBTQ population. And I think it's important to note the work that some of us have done in the room, including uh, Councilman Conza Hall, surrounding uh, LGBT rights. And right now, the transgender community is certainly under attack nationwide. And I would certainly give a voice to ensure that our trans transgender brothers and sisters are protected and that they enjoy some of the privileges and freedoms that those of us in the holistic mainstream LGBT community enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Your 30 seconds is up. Thank you. Can so, I jump uh, in since I, my I, name was called? Yeah, I would second that as well. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, great. Seconds, and thank you. I, I also oh, want to echo and, and agree. Uh, and working in particular with solutions, not punishment, there's a heavy, heavy transgender community right on 3rd and 4th and 5th Street in Piedmont. And for many years, they were ostracized, attacked, and basically put under the thumb of the whole city um, by, by everyone you can imagine. But we began to work together, created a dialogue, built trust and rapport, and began to figure out solutions and not just have police arresting people because well-heeled folks had moved in and they felt like it was disturbing their peace. Um, and that's Help not right because everyone seconds, deserves so. justice. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, um, Mr. Oliver, did you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I would. I am a member of the LGBT community and I do want to remind folks while we're talking about trans rights, you know, uh, our struggle for civil rights really got started in 1969 with the Stonewall riots. And I'd like to remind folks that it's actually uh, trans women of color who really kicked off that, uh, that, 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 uh, that movement at Stonewall. And what it was is it was a group of people who had been routinely abused by government standing up and saying, we're not gonna take this anymore and we're not gonna take the police abuse. And so I would stand with our LGBT community. And uh, in fact, I think that LGBT people should be added to the Civil Rights Act uh, as a population because they Mr. suffer much of the same discrimination. All right, Mr. Oliver, you. your 30 seconds is up, thank you. So we're winding up. We're getting ready for the home stretch. And I'm going to ask each of you, um, you know, you only have a short period of time in office. You have about 60 days plus or minus, give or two a day here and there. What is your number one priority and why? And uh, I'm gonna start with um, Mr. Franklin. With a brief term, it's important to hit the ground running. The two issues I find most compelling that I would devote my time to immediately 
number one passage of the Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Now, thanks to Alabama Representative Terry Sewell, HR 4 has already been passed by the House. The hold up and obstacles in the Senate. And I want to stand in the well of Congress and challenge and the power in the Senate, the need for profiles in courage in the Senate. And Ida B. Wells used to say, there is in every person a cord of decency, what, which once struck by the truth, by the truth, it wells out and rings out in righteousness and change. So change can happen. We need to pass that act during this, these sacred final days of John Lewis's life. The other is to empower the government to convene problem solvers and solution makers to ensure that we can attack this abiding problem of COVID-19. It's extraordinary. And I bring a global perspective to this office and the possibilities just as John Lewis had a global perspective. I've walked on all seven continents. I have a perspective that I think is valuable here. It's fascinating. A few months ago, we were worried about Italy, but Italy today has about 250,000 COVID cases with uh, 35,000 deaths. Uh, the United Kingdom, 320,000 uh, cases with about 41,000 deaths. Canada, our next door neighbor whom we should resemble, 123,000 cases with only 9,000 deaths. But the United States of America, with all of our promise and greatness, 5 million, 500,000 cases. Right, but I'm sorry, your time. 77,000 deaths. We need leadership right now. Well. Okay, next question. Uh, again, what is your number one priority and why? Mr. Barrington, Barrington Martin. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to be honest, I have three priorities. The first priority is to hold Congress accountable. Um, the people have been left without for too long, and we've seen the Senate go on recess for entirely too long in the midst of people losing their jobs, in the midst of people not having enough money to pay their bills, to pay their mortgage, and left wondering who is going to help us. My next uh, priority is really bring home the fact to the two mo foremost foundations of my platform, which is universal guaranteed income and universal basic health care services. The reason I said this and how I know that universal guaranteed income needs to be a part of the conversation going forward is because A, our great mayor, Mayor Lance Bottoms, has signed on to the Mayors for Guaranteed Income, and B, we now have the old Fourth Ward Economic Task Force, which is looking at guaranteed income within the old fourth ward impoverished areas. The reason I'm stating this is because even um, before this special election, within my primary, I advocated for universal guaranteed income. And now leadership within our very own city are implicitly advocating for it as well. Um, lastly, I think this is also the, um, the most important thing is that I want to get more people involved within our government and more people involved with the political process. The biggest voting base in, in America are those that do not vote. And my goal is to allow them to understand that they do have a person that understands um, what they're going through. They do have a champion that they can count on to speak with them and more so than anything else, as a young person, as a millennial, I know that someday that I'm going to inherit this nation. And I think that, and I speak for the rest of us millennials, we deserve to inherit the nation the way we want it to. And oftentimes we allow these archaic and outdated ideologies to continuously to stymie the growth and the progress of this nation. And it's time to move forward. And that's why I said at the beginning, I'm offering modern day solutions to modern day problems. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, next question. So um, with all of it that's going on in today's environment uh, with law enforcement, um, you know, we've had a question uh, centered around that and I certainly want to, um, to pose that question, present that uh, as we begin to wrap up. And um, it's come through the chat here and it says uh, the police offer police officers uh, they mandate training. Uh, let's see, the mandated training requires 800 hours, um, but cosmetologists require over 1,200 hours. Uh, what will you do to 
fund sensitivity and de-escalation training? I'm not sure if that is a congressional question or not, but um, certainly going to present that and you can massage or tweak that or take pieces of it if you'd like, but uh, Kwanzaa Hall. Absolutely. Thank you. As a count, sorry, let me put my camera on here. I hit the button by mistake. Thank you very much. So as a council member, our past either authored or was a part of over 700 pieces of legislation. So I've had a knack for actually moving the ball forward, getting things done. Uh, in particular, a suite of criminal justice reform uh, pieces of legislation from body cameras to the solutions not punishment for LGBT community uh, and everything in between marijuana possession of less than an ounce of criminalization. I think the same thing has to be done at the national level. We've got to not just have the conversation, but in times like these, we have situations that are continuing to occur. One thing that we know, if you're a congressperson for the District 5, you're also a congressperson for the entire United States. The discussion about Breonna Taylor is something that must be on the table. You put that on the table and it forces the Justice Department to step in. In the 60s and 50s, the Justice Department was brought in to make things right. Right now, the Justice Department is not stepping into the conversation. So as a council member, I've done it. And as a congressperson, I would use all 10 staff members to make calls, emails, and texts every day to ensure that we address one simple thing, Breonna Taylor. If we address that as an example, and we call on our colleagues to do the same thing until we're all speaking from one voice, that's how you demonstrate leadership. Because if you're a congressman for District 5 in particular, you're supposed to be leading on justice issues. I know there are other things I can do that are legislative, but that's the one that strikes a chord with me. That's the one that I feel. Bridging the gap between the legacies of Ambassador Andrew Young, who was the first congressperson who led in this way, John Lewis, the beloved John Lewis, and the next generation of leaders like Nakima Williams, some of the people on this call, and others who will come behind us. That's why I'm running, and that's why I want to do the things that I've done before in Congress in this very short period of time. I have a track record for doing it, and I can do it again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, one question. Um, what is your number one priority? And um, how are you gonna get that accomplished? And that would be for Representative Thomas. Uh, uh, thank you so much. One thing with, we gotta deal with is that this is a legacy seat. Therefore, the person that feels this seat has to be someone who already not only has courage and conviction, but has results. And when we think about the whole issue of Mount Taylor, which is a travesty, we had that situation in Atlanta with the 92-year-old grandmother that was killed by the police. That was a case that I led the community response. So we're not talking about what can be done, it's we talk about what has already been done. Subsequently, this is the only case, I think, in America where three police went to jail, Red Dog got uh, disbanded, the Citizen Review Board was enacted, the family got $5 million, and DC3, where you can actually stop a person, put them on the ground and frisk them because they what they call a known drug area. This is the only place, I think, in America that justice reform turned out in favor of the family and, and also the victim family did get compensated. So a lot of people are kind of, you know, want to, you know, let's talk about it. But the reality of it is this Congress is not a small matter. You don't need anybody that has a large learning curve. The reality of it is if you send Abel Mabel Thomas, I've already been there on the, at the grassroots in the community, but have been one of the most, most uh, let's put it like this, one of the most accomplished Democratic state legislators that, that is in this body called the Georgia General Assembly. This is a body that uh, mimics the Congress. So send somebody who can hit the ground running, no learning curve, and my party always will be the people, and my party will be making sure that the Voting Rights Act, Protection Act, with John Lewis' name is passed, but also that the CARES Package and the HERO Act also gets passed so we can get money and dollars in the hands of our citizens who are losing their homes and actually are in despair. This is a time for leadership. This is not a time for vision. Representative Thomas, your time is up. Can I, can I rebuttal, please? Is it, is it, can I rebuttal to this? Is it okay? Yes, I'll give you 30 okay. seconds. I think it's important to note that we, we've been talking about experience all day. And we, what I've come to understand and realize that experience has been a hindrance. 
we keep uttering that we're going to um, uplift the legacy of Congressman Lewis by the, by the Voting Rights Act, but it should be an amendment. And I think that needs to be stated. Voting is one of the most integral parts of and the foundation of our democracy and the fact that it continues to be infringed upon lets uh, us know and lets me know as well that these archaic outdated mindsets and ideologies continues to be a cyclic relationship in which we continue to go in cycles instead of having the necessary solutions. Mr. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Martin, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and let me um, go ahead and ask one more question. Um, again, we go back to police officers they're mandated to um, 800 training hours, but the cosmetologists require over 1,200 training hours. What will you do to fund sensitivity and de-escalation training? Uh, Stephen Muhammad. Thank you for that question. Well, one of the things is that the police officers that come into the black community, most a lot of them are rogue cops. They come in because they said that's where the action is. They're gonna come down there and make a little extra money. They're gonna shake people down. They're going to shoot people in the back. We've seen it on the videos. All of them are not. Now, one of the things about Atlanta, I've lived in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, most of them, and I've been in most of the major cities. Atlanta has a real good group of police officers, really does compared to other major cities, but there are still rogue cops. And if we do not have citizen patrols, that's one of the things that I remember when I was coming up in Chicago is we used to have neighborhood watch where we have something similar called a 10,000 fearless and we're over in the Vine City English area. But we have eyes and with these eyes we're watching and we're looking for the rogue cops, the criminals and anyone who is creating injustice in the neighborhood. And what we do then is we're, we're working with law enforcement the sheriff's department. I work with Sheriff Jackson. I've worked with the Atlanta Police Department and we work with them to root out those evil doors who then prey upon the community and they abuse people. We have to get them out. And the only way that's gonna happen is the citizens. The citizens see it. Their commanding officers don't see it. They're in their, their towers, they're in their offices. So we have to come together as citizens and point out these rogue roguish cops so that we can get them off the streets and we can clean up our communities and make it a safe and decent place to live, which is what I've worked for my entire adult life. We need safe and decent places to live because right now the black community in most places is not a safe and decent place to live. South Fulton has pockets of areas that are unsafe. Atlanta has pockets of areas that are unsafe. DeKalb County has it and we need to work together to solve that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, one more question. For these next 60 days, what is your number one priority and why? Representative Waits. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's been echoed several times tonight that we have a very limited amount of time uh, to accomplish any task. Uh, and it's also been stated that uh, the Congressman's seat is sacred and coveted. And I agree with that. Uh, for me, the top three priorities would be constituent service, quality of life issues, ensuring that every American has access to health care, and finally advocating uh, for universal health care because COVID-19 is probably going to be one of the number one issues in this campaign that we're going to see in November. Finally, ensuring and working together to elect a new president of the United States. I think that all of us on the stage, regardless of what our political affiliation all agree that something needs to change uh, at the national level of government. So the three parties, again, would be constituent services. Uh, it would be uh, working to advocate for universal health care. Uh, many Americans right now are without health care and COVID-19 has been devastating to many families, including my own. And finally, working to elect uh, Joe Biden uh, and uh, the vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris so that we can move forward some of the things that we've been talking about tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it is um, that each of the candidates have had four questions each this evening. They've not been in the same order, but some have been the same questions. So you've heard uh, various comments and responses to those. And um, you may ask why, because as an elected official, sometimes you have to answer off the cuff, but you got to pay attention to what's going on around you. And so that was one of the reasons for um, presenting the questions uh, out of sequence. So um, 
Now, what I'd like to do as we come to close is to give each of the candidates two minutes to share with us a closing statement as to why they should be elected and why they think they are the best candidate. And then to share with us or the audience, if they like, how to get in contact with them. I'm gonna start with Chase Oliver. Well, thank you very much. And I wanna go ahead and say uh, thank you again to the Southern Metro Democratic Women's Council for hosting this event and allowing me to speak to the voters. Uh, I am running with the express uh, goal of getting ending qualified immunity done in these four months. It is something that is overdue and it needs to be done. Uh, I am running to provide more choices and more voices in our election. Many times when we, uh, when we have a ballot in here in Georgia, there's only one name on the ballot in November and that's due to gerrymandering, ballot access issues, and that in itself is its own form of, sort of, form of voter suppression in addition to the voter suppression effort of Kemp and others. So I want to uh, allow the voters to see that there is more than just two parties at play here who are trying to solve things like criminal justice reform, who are trying to do things like have a better response to COVID-19. These are the issues that I think the voters need to see. And I'm very, very uh, pleased that you have given me the chance to speak to the voters. And again, I wanna fight for things that can be done. Ending qualified immunity can be done. It could have been done months ago if the will of the political establishment were there. And that's what I'm going to Washington DC to do, to challenge the political establishment. And when they don't, if they don't, end qualified immunity, end no-knock raids, end cash bail, I will make sure everyone knows exactly who stood in the way of those things, because that's what needs to be done. It is a long time. George Floyd was murdered months ago. People have been in the streets since then. People have been fighting for these issues since long before then. And it's time that those voices get heard in the halls of Congress. And no more games, no more political back and forth, no more two-party games. Challenge the establishment. Get the things done. Serve the people. That is why I am running. And I'm not running for a political grandeur or for ego or, you know, I am running to serve out the legacy of John Lewis. And that is for fighting for freedom, liberty, and justice for every person in the 5th District and across this country. And that is why I'm running. If you want to get uh, in touch with my campaign, chaseforhouse.com. Please check it out. Thank get you, in touch Oliver, with me. Two minutes Thank you. Thank you. Next, closing statement. Um, Mr. Franklin, Robert Franklin, um, closing statement, why you're the best candidate and uh, how to get in contact with you. Thank you to the South Metro Democratic women, the ladies in blue who are doing such an important service to our democracy and to the 790,000 people of the fifth district. Mm -hmm. I am running and I want your vote on September 29th because right now, the good people of this district do not have a voice and do not have a vote in Congress. Meanwhile, major questions are being addressed. Uh, the, protecting the post office, flattening the COVID curve, ensuring that uh, stimulus checks are getting to small businesses that are struggling, but also protecting your right to vote and ending structural racism and police violence. We need to honor John Lewis's final days. That's why you should care about voting. Don't wait or sit on the bench until November. This election is important and I want to earn your vote. You need someone who knows Congress and knows the district, who can speak truth to power and who can help to heal and redeem the soul of the nation by bringing people together. That's what uh, John Lewis said in his final testament, his final letter to us. I want you to come together to redeem the soul of America. I spent many hours talking to John Lewis in that congressional office. I know members of Congress. They know me. Google September 20, 1982, and you will find what happened in 1992 as the Washington Post reported on a speech that I delivered to Congress that day and challenged the nation with a diagnosis of what was wrong during the Clinton administration and the impeachment and what needed to happen. And so I'd like to have your vote. You can reach me at Franklin for Congress 2020, Franklin for Congress 2020.com. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, closing statement and why you're the best candidate and how the voters can get in contact with you. Barrington Martin. 
Thank you. Um, I think it's important for me to express my gratitude for you all giving me the opportunity to express um, in totality everything about my platform. I also think it's important for me to remind all of you that it's just simply time for a new direction because new challenges await us. And if we continue to address these problems with the same old outdated archaic ideologies, the people will continue to struggle. I will also like to take the time to thank um, the 20,096 voters that came out to vote for me in the primary in the midst of bad weather, in the midst of this um, voter suppression as well. Um, they are the reason, and you, the whole entire district are the reason that I'm here speaking right now in front of you for this special election. I think that it's a shame that the Democratic Party did what they did as far as nominating a, a, a candidate for November's election without allowing these 20,096 voices to be heard as well as the entire district itself. Um, I think it's important to remind you guys again that I was here in the beginning. I had the courage and the honor to stand in front of a Titan and take the political beating that I took because the people needed to see and the people needed to understand that they had someone that believed in them and they had someone who would um, speak up for them, even though they've been long forgotten and underserved within this district. Ask yourselves, where were everyone else on this panel June 9th? Why do they care right now? It's always been about my city for me. This is my home and I have a distinct obligation to make sure that everyone is protected right now and everyone is protected for the future. This is why I created the People's Bailout because it's the current solution for today and it's definitely the current solution for the future. I know without a shadow of a doubt I am the best candidate for right now, and I'm definitely the best candidate for moving forward. My name is Barrington Martin II again, and I am the new trouble that Congress needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Um, same question, closing statement, why you're the best candidate and how the voters can get in contact with you. Mr. Muhammad. Thank you. <clears throat> well, why am I the best candidate? I'm the best candidate because my skill set fits the current number one problems in America. The number one problem in America is that we're having a racial divide. It's very easy to get to come together on soft issues, but the hard issues, the hard issues of how we're going to solve the problem of race, how we're gonna solve the problem of housing, job skills, those things are the things that we have to solve problems on. So I have the skill set that is best suited to work in that area. Now, going to Washington, you're going to spend more days away from D.C., away from the House floor in these next uh, 90 days than you will there. So I would take my profile to create a new reality. I would go throughout the district, find out it is what it is that they that the district needs in Southern Metro and DeKalb, those neglected areas that have not been really tended to by Congress. I would go to those areas and say, let me find out what they need. And I will put together a program for whoever comes behind me. These are the real issues. I didn't have time to deal with it. And I was not up here on an ego trip or a political opportunity because I said I had retired, but then I came out of retirement because I wanted a political opportunity or an ego trip for whatever reason. But I, I want to find out what it is that you need and my legacy. I, we know what John, legacy, John Lewis's legacy, but my legacy would be that I would have created a package, put together a program that whoever comes behind me, that's what we fail to do. The youth, those who come behind us, we don't have a program for them. This is what you need to do. You don't have to guess, you take it. So Muhammad for Congress, telephone number 404-919-1092. And we will create a new reality for all of the fifth district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same question, closing statement, why you're the best candidate and how the voters can get in contact with you. Representative Keisha Waite. Thank you so much uh, to the tonight's organizers for this opportunity. On uh, my website is KeishaWaites.com. I've taken the liberty of posting that information as well as my personal cell phone number. Uh, I don't think that any of us will fill the shoes of Congressman John Lewis. I think we can all agree to that. But I do think it's important that our next representative embody that same spirit of servanthood. Uh, I am a woman of faith and I am guided by a specific set of principles that govern every single aspect of my life. I am running for this seat because I simply wish to continue the legacy and the work started by Congressman John Lewis. Margaret Thatcher made an interesting comment 
many, many decades ago. She said, oftentimes people show up to be something versus do something. I'm simply here for the same reason I went to the Georgia General Assembly in 2012, and that is to accomplish something. Finally, I am a small business owner. I intimately understand the challenges that small business owners here in Georgia, as well as around the country, the challenges that they are facing. And I think it's important that we have someone interested in advocating for marginalized communities, working families, and small business owners. We know that Ivy League colleges have been bailed out. We know that there's conversations about building new FBI buildings, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so I'm interested in common sense legislation. I'm interested in bringing people together collaboratively. We've seen what division has done at the federal levels of government. And it is my hope and prayer that I am your next choice on September 29th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same question, closing statement, why you're the best candidate and how voters can get in contact with you, Kwanzaa Hall. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm Kwanzaa Hall and I'm running to bridge the gap between the great legacy that Ambassador Andrew Young and Congressman John Lewis left on us and to ensure that the next generation of freedom fighters are empowered to do the things that not only have been done before us, but also looking forward to the future. I'm excited about the potential of hitting the ground running immediately in October to stump for the Biden-Harris ticket in a way that I did for other presidential candidates, also for governors around the country to bring the energy and the force of all the exciting uh, people that are part of this campaign to bear on that election. Of course, Nakima Williams will have a smooth transition, but one thing I know for sure, when you're in a position like this, you have to know how to navigate. You have to have a track record. You have to have friends and relationships in all kinds of places. I already have those relationships and I have a track record for getting things done. There are a couple of things that Congressman Lewis and I were working on that are not complete. They haven't been mentioned today and I'm gonna mention them at a future time. But these items are items that I know will not only honor his legacy because that's important, but even more important is creating a new legacy. We are all still talking about the 60s. And when I saw pictures at the field of the funeral and I thought about my dad, I thought about how we haven't done enough. And I'm almost 50 years old right now. But I want to be able to empower young people like Barrington and others to be able to carry this mantle forward. So this is the time to bridge that gap and ensure that we have a new legacy going forward, not the old legacy, a new legacy. So I'm Kwanzaa Hall and I want to be your next congressman. www.kwanzaahall.com. 404-454-1116. I'm on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Kwanzaa Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilman. And um, again, closing statement, why you're the best candidate and how voters can get in contact with you. Representative Mabel Thomas. Uh, what I want to say is for you to, to tell the voters that um, we need tried and true leadership. There's nothing wrong with experience. John Lewis went to Congress at the age of 47 and stayed to the age of 80. He had made a big impact before he even went to uh, Congress. But what I'm here to tell you is this is a legacy seat. It is not for those that give lip service, but for someone that gives community service and people service. We need leadership who has the courage to get in the way, who has not played it safe, who stands for positive change and good trouble. The reality of it is, is we cannot afford a learning curve. Congress is a big deal. We can act like you can just come in and just start doing everything. First thing you gotta do is understand the rules. Also, you have to do is build partnerships with the Georgia delegation because that's the delegation that you are working with to make impact for Georgia. Also, I will say, I'm not ashamed to say that as a young person, I too, went early and made sure that I walked with John Lewis across that Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, I made sure that when the people were feeding the hungry, that I fed the hungry as a young person. I've been on more than 50 marches dealing with righteousness. I talked about the issue with uh, Katherine Johnson, her being someone who was killed by the police. So I'm definitely for, for justice reform, and I don't even call it criminal justice reform, because a lot of times the people who are getting killed are not criminals. We just need justice reform. 
I'm here to tell you at the end of the day, it is important that we do have people to stand up for reproductive justice, stand up for the rights of the LGBTQ plus community, to stand up for working families, to stand up for uh, small business people, stand up for veterans. I'm a person who has worked in these particular areas. I also understand that it's always time for positive change. Who I am is a leader. I'm a leader who's worked for positive change, and I will continue to do that. No learning curve. Way to get in touch with me is www.ablemable.com. And also, we have a separate uh, website on the um, Facebook as well. So we are committed to the people. Uh, me and my team will continue to work for the people. And I respect all the people that's running. But at the end of the day, vote Abel Mabel Thomas. Get the job done. Get the job done right. And get the job done with integrity. Thank you and power to the people. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the candidates that joined us this evening. Thank you all so much to all of our guests online who took time out of their busy evenings to, uh, to, to dial in and to see what's going on and to hear from our candidates because there will be a special election on Tuesday, September 29th uh, for the interim uh, seat, John Lewis's unfulfilled term. But more so than anything, let me leave you with this. Uh, well, and before I do that, we just certainly hope that this evening's information will help you make an informed decision when you go to the vote, when you go to the polls next month. We always want to make sure that our voters know who is on the ballot. They know what is on the ballot. They know when to vote and they know where to vote. So with that, I say no before you go. But more so than anything, vote like your life depends on it. Thank you to everyone who's joined us again. And we certainly hope that this information has been very informative and useful to you. I'm now going to turn this back over. I'm going to turn this over to LaShondra Little, and she's going to share some additional information with you. LaShondra. Hi, everyone again. Uh, my name is LaShondra Little, as she just stated, and I served as the chair for our South Metro Democratic Women's Council Census Committee. And we just wanted to give you an announcement as we are less than, well, pretty much a little over a month away from the census deadline, we have embarked upon a census town hall series. And so we'll have our last town hall series on September 22nd. And we just want to invite you all who are watching with us right now to invite those you, who you know to be able to come on in and listen to us as we really talk about the importance of the census and that you can invite those who probably still need to complete the census because our response rate in the South Metro area is pretty low. And so we just wanted to remind everyone of, about the census and invite everyone to watch, watch with us on Facebook Live September 22nd, our last forum in our census town hall series. And we thank you all so much again for joining us our president actually lost internet connection. So Kathy, we'll turn it back over to you to close it out. Thank you again. So now you've heard it from the women in blue. Uh, let's do what we know is the right thing to do. And that is to, uh, to get out and vote. You have again, all the information. You have information about the candidates who will be on the ballot in a few weeks, but make an informed decision. And like I said, know before you go. Thank you to everyone who's joined us, and that'll be it. We'll conclude for the evening. Take care. Thank you. Have a Thank good evening. Thank you.